Welcome to Sacred Cow Shipyards, where no ship is safe from being called a piece of ship. Somehow or another, the topic of a very large wrench at the stern of a certain U.S. naval warship came up during a previous episode. The wrench serves a purpose. We're actually going to get there. But it's going to be a long, convoluted route to get there, so, you know, uh, attach your restraint harnesses, put on your crash helmets, and away we go! For example, do you know the apocryphal explanation as to why the left and right sides of a ship are respectively called the port and starboard sides? Well, if you've been with this channel since the beginning, or you've subjected yourself to watching my early episodes, you would know, but just for those of y'all who are new here, I'll recap it for you as succinctly as I can, which is to say not at all. Basically, once upon a time, ships of, well, they weren't even ships really, they were just overgrown boats, were steered by way of an overgrown oar shoved into the water on the right side of the ship. This was called the steering board. It was a board. You use it to steer. You humans are really not imaginative most of the time, honestly. And since this board was on the right side of the ship, you couldn't exactly pull up to a pier on the right side of the ship because then you'd stand the chance of, you know, breaking your steering board. And those were expensive and it was a pain in the butt to replace, blah, 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 so on and so forth. So you'd pull up to the port on the left side of the ship. So the left side of the ship became the port side of the ship and the right side of the ship became the steering board i.e. starboard side of the ship. And in case all of that is just very, very confusing to you, just know this. Port and left in the English language on your planet share the same number of letters. It's the easy way to remember which one's which. And if you can't figure out the other one based off of left is port, then I, I don't know what to tell you, man. But anyways, steering is kind of important, both for vessels that ply aquatic trade lanes or whatever the hell, and for ships out in space. Especially ships out in space, because that is functionally a frictionless environment. So once you start going in one direction, you kind of keep going, and you can start going really, really fast. And if you're going really, really fast, it would be nice to be able to steer once in a while. Now, I don't really personally uh, see a direct connection between, you know, nautical vessels steering concepts and space vessels steering concepts, but maybe what I'm going to talk about will at least knock some ideas loose in your squishy little noggins, and you can run with them as you see fit. Because yes, initially your overgrown boats were steered by an overgrown paddle, and then you moved on up into technological chains, and you made the, the ship's wheel, which is, you know, everyone knows what the ship's wheel is. I mean, it shows up in like Pirates of the Caribbean and all kinds of other stuff. This ship's wheel is absolutely insane, just because of the size of the ship and the number of people that operate it, and the fact that they engraved, Princess is much pleased on the side of the wheel. There's a story about that. It's the HMS Warrior. It didn't really seem that interesting to me. But anyways, it's a great example of, like, the ship's wheel gone, like, fractal. And in your current day and time, well, it's complicated. Apparently, your United States Navy has blamed a lot of its collisions on the fact that it uses approximately 23 different steering mechanisms to control its various warships each class of warship, and in fact, inside of each class of warship, there are a variety of steering methods on the bridge. Yes, that is patently absurd. But people keep trying new ideas and trying things and trying this and trying that, and oh my god, there's no consistency. You can't train someone on one platform and expect it to translate anywhere. You have everything from the traditional wheel to basically a little tiny, like, three-inch diameter wheel to a joystick to a touch screen. Oh, I should do a whole episode on absolutely how horrible non-haptic feedback is for your squishy little brains. You need that touch feedback to know what you're doing, to know that you're doing something. Touch screens are not something you should be using for 
things that you want feedback on. One of those is steering. Also shouldn't be used in wet environments. Also shouldn't be used in environments that take damage, like this bridge of a warship. What happens if the touchscreen gets cracked, you f***ing imbeciles? Which I suppose is as good a segue into the purpose of this episode as any other segue might be. Going fast in one direction is all good and well. What happens if you have to turn? Well, aquatic navy warships, of course, accomplish this by rudders. And even your rudder technology keeps changing year over year. What you're looking at right now is the stern of one of your modern United States uh, destroyers with curved rudders. Yes, I, I, I did exactly say curved rudders. Apparently, these rudders cut down on cavitation from the rudder if you steer hard enough. And cavitation is basically bubbles just, you know, forming because the water got really, 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 really angry and expressed its anger by way of bubbles, which make noise. Now, I mean, technically, uh, cavitation is a twofold problem. The first problem is it's very, very noisy. And the reality is that every surface ship is noisy to a submarine. But the second problem is that it causes damage. Those little bubbles form and collapse rapidly right on the trailing edge of uh, screws and rudders and stuff like that. And they cause significant amount of damage to the metal. So maybe this will cut it down. Maybe it won't. I don't know. But that's just the physical method by which the ship steers itself. How do you control that physical method by which the ship steers itself? Well, that's a complicated conversation. Um, so basically, up on the bridge, there is some device, which again, apparently there is at least one score too many different control devices to control how a ship steers itself up on the bridge of a warship. But what that device is doing, it, it I mean, it's not actually connected to the rudder because no, on, on like frigates, which I guess are now decommissioned in the United States Navy, the, their little three inch steering wheel, sure as hell, is not connected directly to the rudder. There's something else going on there, right? Well, the something else is a whole pile of very, very complicated electronics, electrics, computerized nonsense, and hydraulics. And that's basically the, the big kicker here is most modern ships, warships, commercial ships, whatever the hell, move their rudders by way of hydraulic rams. And those are basically pistons, uh, to put it another way. And the, the control devices control a computer or a electronic system that controls how those rams move back and forth so on and so forth and up on the bridge you can turn a wheel and by way of electrical impulses you are controlling these rams and these rams are shoving this rudder back and forth as fast as they can to control the ship all good and well that's pretty awesome i mean seriously you mm, frigates again had a three inch steering wheel and they were pretty big boats at the time, and you could just control them by this little three-inch steering wheel, the entire ship. Well, what happens if the computer breaks? Or what happens if a wire gets loose? Or what happens if something else breaks? Well, the possibility of breakage, which is always a real thing on any ship, warship or not, is why warships man a space called aft steering during complicated evolutions. Basically, when they're coming into or going out of port, when they are trying to do underway replenishments, when they are transiting the, uh, the, the Panama Canal on your planet, when they're doing anything where a steering failure would cause a massive loss of life and, well, currency, aft steering comes into play. Now, out on the open ocean, if there's a steering failure, then the failure gets called away and aft steering gets manned because the steering gets called away. But in really, really complicated evolutions, aft steering is manned specifically because if there is a failure, aft steering has to take over. And I hear you squishies, wails, and moans about what is aft steering. Well, just wait a second, you fucking ingrates. Aft steering is the space immediately above the rudders on any ship 
anywhere, warship or not. It's where the riders plug into the ship because the riders aren't attached to the ship in front of them. Oh no, they're attached to the ship above them. And the ship above them is where the housing is for, again, those hydraulic rams that move that rudder back and forth so the ship can steer itself. Aft steering on warships is so named because it is the place that you can steer the ship from the aft, which is not normally where you're supposed to steer a ship from, but that's how it got its name. Anyways, the equipment necessary to actually actuate, operate, move the rudder are in aft steering. That's where you do the maintenance. That's where you do all the operations necessary to turn the rudder. And depending on the ship, it's either like just down a ladder way, by which I mean a stairway, because we're using Navy terminology right now, or it's down something called an escape trunk. You don't want to have to deal with escape trunks. They're not actually meant for escaping. They're not actually meant for humies. They're like Jeffrey's tubes met Nightmare on Elm Street and had a baby and it was like mutated and dysfunctional and bad. Because some of your warships have these things called well decks. They're specifically designed to sink and let the seawater come into the middle section of the ship so that the big ship can launch little boats out of the back end of the ship. Except the rudder is under the well deck. So to get to aft steering, as in the place where the equipment lives that controls the rudder, you have to like crawl down the back side of the ship, crawl underneath the ship, and then you get to aft steering eventually. Maybe. Maybe you'll end up in a parallel dimension. Maybe you'll end up, I don't even know where, but still, it's not a place you go very frequently unless you have to do maintenance on the steering equipment, or you have aft steering duty, which is pretty common for a lot of people. So why would you have aft steering duty? Well, because what happens if the steering up on the bridge fails? Well, why is that relevant to aft steering? Well, like I said, all of the equipment necessary to steer the ship is in aft steering. So if whatever connection there is from the bridge to that equipment through whatever computers or electronics or electrics or whatever the hell broke, then there is a sound powered phone connection from aft steering to the bridge and the bridge can simply tell aft steering that hey we lost steering take over and there's actually this big honking toggle switch or rotary switch depending on the style of style of ship in aft steering saying who has control right now whether it's the bridge or aft steering and if the bridge says hey we lost control then aft steering's first response is crank turn that switch and hey now we have control oh crap and the bridge will tell aft steering what rudder angle they want it's definitely not optimal but is totally better than losing all steering totally entirely and yes there is actually a cute little wheel down in aft steering where you can actually like turn the rudder back and forth using the wheel as you would expect to be able to do on the bridge, but it's just an aft steering. And depending on the failure, uh, the bridge can actually set a, a, a repeater, I believe it's called a telegraph, telling aft steering what exact angle of the rudder they want on this little two-way dial system up in an overhead somewhere. But, 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 at, that's only part of aft steering's a reason for existence is is the bridge's failure to communicate back to that steering gear. If if that's the only failure, then you're in good shape and aft steering can do what it needs to do. What happens if there's a different failure in the steering gear? What happens if, say, those hydraulic rams are not responding to the inputs provided by the wheel that is meant to provide them inputs? Well, again, that's why aft steering is manned. The hydraulic rams actually have a toggle switch on them and you can turn the switch left and you can turn the switch right and that will tell the ram which way to go. It will basically bleed off hydraulic fluid one way or the other as long as the pump is running and you can manually control the, the ram back and forth and the rudder therefore back and forth by way of this really honking big arm that you're literally using to force hydraulic fluid one way or the other because the pump is still running. And if you're smart, 
You're asking what happens if the pump stops running. Well, then things get really complicated and really slow, and I hope this is not an emergency situation, because if the hydraulic pump stops running, well, then the Humies back in half steering have to get on either a wheel or a hand pump like you would get at a, a well and literally pump the hydraulics back and forth. And there's one wheel and or one hand pump for each side of the hydraulics, and they're pumping this way or they're pumping the other way to get the rudder to move back and forth. And understandably, given that your Humi form is weak and small and nowhere near as powerful as a glorious hydraulic fluid pump, this takes just a second. It takes an honest to God second. You've got people back there sweating their post exteriors off trying to make the rudder move one way and then they got to make it move the other way and they got to go back get on the other wheel or the other pump arm and crank away at it again and again and again and again and the reaction time is just miserable but still so already we've talked about like controlling it up on the bridge like you're supposed to if that control system fails and we can control it in aft steering and it's not too much of a lag because the bridge just tells aft steering what they want, much like the officer of the deck and the conning officer tell the helmsman up on the bridge what they want, and the lag isn't too bad. And then if the wheel, for whatever reason, fails, there's a control on the pump to tell it which way to pump, and your accuracy goes down a little, but it's still just as fast as it would be otherwise. And then if the pump fails, well, then we have to go resort to manual effort of pumping the hydraulic fluid back and forth for this massive rudder for this massive warship. Okay, what happens if the hydraulics in total fail? Pump, hydraulic fluid, lines, everything. One of the ram blows out or something. It gets shot and explodes. What are you going to do then? Well, on big ships, like, say, battleships and carriers and whatnot else, you're, you're pretty much fucked. There is nothing you can do at that point. The good news is those ships have multiple rudders. So if one fails, you can fall back and just use the other one. It will not be a perfect solution, but you can still at least steer the ship. And then if all the rudders fail, those ships also have multiple screws. Now, a lot of those ship screws were steam powered, which means you have to like slow the entire shaft down, stop it, and then start spinning it the other way if you want to back the screw as opposed to running it forward in case you wanted to like turn the ship like a tank basically doing what the left screw forward and the right screw backwards makes it turn left but it's still at least some modicum of control now again since i keep coming back to them on older ships that are now discontinued like say the oliver hazard perry class frigate in the united states navy well they only have the one screw so you can't do the whole tank thing. And they only have the one rudder. So if it goes down, if its hydraulics explode all over aft steering, well, it's going to get very slippery in there. But now you have absolutely no steering. What do you do? Well, this, this, boys and girls and sophons of all ages, is where the massive honking wrench comes in. I couldn't find a photo of it. I did my best to search. There aren't very many photos of the insides of once active U.S. Navy warships, except those that make it to museums, and I don't think any of the Oliver Hazard Perrys made it to museums, so I couldn't find a photo of the wrench in question. You'll just have to trust me that it exists. It is approximately eight feet long. The hole on the wrench, and it's a, a complete circle wrench, not one of the ones that has an open, open end, is about two feet in diameter and there is in fact a nut on top of the the axle that the rudder is attached to onto which the people in aft steering are meant to uh, drop this wrench and then they are meant to use this wrench as a tiller bar yes you did in fact hear that right the expectation was that if everything else failed three or four people in aft steering would be able to move this massive wrench up on top of the shaft for the rudder and steer a 4,200 ton vessel by hand. This is actually in the documentation for like failure modes in aft steering. I shit you not. 
I mean, on the one hand, it's great to see the oldies and goldies come out and play, because once upon a time, rudders were steered by tiller bars. That's why they were called tiller bars, because they were moving the tiller, which was another term for a rudder. But on the other hand, I mean, it's great that the Navy had so many, like, failure modes. I mean, we went through, what, like five or something? I mean, backups for backups for backups. Two is one and one is none, or whatever that saying is. But on the gripping hand, holy hell! I'm not even sure the Humies and that steering could actually lift that wrench off the wall where it was mounted and probably painted in place, much less actually make any impact on what direction the warship is going. And sure, you could get more people down there, and maybe if you put enough squishies on it, they could maybe push the rudder in some direction or another, until it, like, hit a current or something, and then, like, half of them got cut in half as the wrench whipped back across them. This does not seem like an optimal solution. Alright, so where am I going with this? Well, I guess the big question is, how is your spaceship steering? I mean, it's kind of a big question when you get right down to it. If you're using some sort of, like, gravitic or reactionless system, I mean, that's pretty much what you're going to be using for both propulsion and steering. But what happens if that goes down? Well, then I guess you're back to, like, RCS thrusters that your normie, eh, low-tech people still use even to this day and use in a lot of series and science fiction where you shoot a jet and it twists a ship and you can go the other direction. The best example of this, of course, is the Star Fury fighter from Babylon 5. But what happens if, like, thrusters get clogged, or they run out of fuel, or they get shot off or something? I mean, I guess you could go back to reaction wheels, where you have a, a spinny thing and you use gyroscopic precession to torque the ship appropriately in the right direction. Or maybe your actual main drives are rotatable around the ship itself and they can twist and turn and point in the direction you need to apply thrust to. But still, you need to think about this while you are designing your ships, because failures happen. Even if you're not a warship being actively shot at, things will break. Entropy wins. You have to plan for that, especially depending on how long out you plan on going and how far you might be from any kind of support. What are you going to do when things break and you're traveling at a significant fraction of sea. And if you hit something, it will be terminal for the entire ship. What are you going to do? Maybe the answer is you have multiple RCS networks controlled by multiple computers and fed by multiple fuel sources. I mean, redundancy is always awesome, right? Maybe the answer is you stick your cranium between your lower extremities and kiss your posterior goodbye. I don't know, but it's something that you have to decide for any ship that you are creating in any universe you're creating it in. Now, maybe failures don't exist in the universe that you're writing. Maybe failures aren't actually part of the story, but still, it wouldn't hurt to mash that I'm helping you believe button for people who are looking for redundant systems. Because, I mean, if nothing else, one of the reasons why the recent Netflix Lost in Space television series is so ridiculously stupid is because nothing had backups. Absolutely nothing. This was a deep space colony transport ship meant to go to a place that was still already colonized, but still. Really? No backups at all? Come on. And if nothing else, I mean, if you're a particularly good imaginator or writer or whatever the hell correct term is, you can always come up with some ridiculous story like some f***ing huge wrench. I mean, seriously, who came up with that idea and thought it was a good one? And that's all from Sacred Cow Shipyards. Please be advised that any ship left on the dock for more than 24 hours will be compressed to a cube at the owner's expense. Have a nice day.